Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come in and uh, meet you all and, and speak here tonight. Um, my name is Paco. I work at Concurrent in San Francisco. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Um, I work on a project called Cascading, and uh, you may or may not have heard of Cascading before, but there's probably a pretty good chance that, that you use the API in, in some manner. Um, definitely a lot of banks, and transportation, healthcare, um, and for that matter, social networks and mobile devices are, are using Cascading in production, have been using it for about the past five years. So um, I'd like to uh, tonight talk a bit about what Cascading is, how it really fits into the context of an enterprise app. And we'll talk about Cascading, also some of the DSLs like uh, Casblog and Scalding. And uh, Dean's going to go into uh, more detail on Scalding after me. And uh, I'll, I'll show a little bit about uh, some of the code samples of you know, how you get started writing Cascading apps. And then dive in or delve into a little bit of computer science theory behind it, uh, what we think of. Uh, speak about enterprise workflows um, and how some of that theory uh, informs the software engineering. Um, I'll show a, a few aspects for developers, analysts, and scientists, um, and uh, hopefully a lot of pointers in your articles. <clears throat> My background, by the way, is uh, I've been leading data teams for about the past 10 years, so I'm a data scientist but also you know, engineering manager. Uh, I was formerly a uh, customer using Cascading, uh, so I, I came into the company concurrent uh, about a year ago as batch number two when we started commercializing. So the, the first thing is, I'd like to show uh, an example enterprise workflow. So this is a hypothetical example. The idea is that you've got some Hadoop in the middle there, but it's integrating with a lot of other parts. So definitely when you go and, and run your app, in this case here, uh, there are some results that get pushed out into, say, memcache uh, to be able to fed out, be fed, to be fed out to uh, customer APIs. So the, the front end aspects of the app, the line of business needs, are usually what drive the deployment of big data apps. And then on the back office side, there's generally a lot of investment in terms of people, infrastructure, process, um, a lot of that is going to need to be addressed. It's not going to go change in a heartbeat. Um, so we have to take that into account. But the heavy lifting is where we're taking and moving more and more workloads out on Hadoop uh, to be able to take advantage of uh, the economics of it, um, the scale of it. So uh, we think a lot about Hadoop apps in the context of system integration. Cascading is very much about not just using Hadoop um, in isolation, but actually Hadoop plus something else. So the something else means you probably get data coming out of log files or out of the database. You probably drop the data results someplace else. Maybe they're analytics queues or going into a memory cache. Um, but it's integration. Uh, formally speaking, cascading is a pattern language. So a, a pattern language, that's a term that came out of architecture. Uh, of course, it's used in software engineering like Gang of Four. Uh, but the idea is that you take a, a fairly complex problem space and you can construct a language such that when parts fit together into a unit of work, the process of fitting them together ensures that certain best practices are met. So for us, the best practices are how can you build an app that runs in parallel at scale? And how can you build it to satisfy enterprise requirements Process and um, So we have a lot of design principles inside of Cascading, and at the end of the day, we're trying to make the apps simple to build, and very easy to test, and very robust. Um, now, you know, Cascading itself is a Java API, uh, but there are very popular DSLs now in Scala, Scalding, and Closure, Casper, and actually. I monitor a lot of use cases, but you know about it. a lot of work on case studies, and more and more of the new deployments that we're seeing are either in Scalding or Casablanca. Uh, the API is Apache 2 license, the source of all on GitHub. We've got a, a Maven repo called contrars.org for uh, third-party contributors. 
And, uh, and we've been out there since uh, the latter part of 2007. So there's enterprise deployments for this that are you know, more than five years old. Um, as far as industry analysts, uh, they've been picking up on the aspect of uh, staffing, really. Because at the end of the day, um, one of the problems with Hadoop is that it, it does require expertise. And, and that's great for everybody here in this room. But for a lot of companies, what that means is you get a bottleneck in terms of how can you address um, hiring of people that have expertise in Hadoop. How can you retrain staff? Um, how can you retool to adapt to what needs to be going on ahead. And as uh, CIO Magazine said so there, one of the things is that by using an abstraction layer like cascading, you can help to cut down those costs of the staffing costs. Now, <clears throat> as far as deployments, we've got some uh, excellent case studies out of Twitter and Etsy. Um, Climate Corp is probably one of the biggest case studies. It's actually, Amazon has it as a case study for their biggest hacking deployment. Um, there's Nokia Maps, uh, Factual, uh, a whole bunch of different companies in different kinds of use cases. And we've been partnering with pretty much everybody who has a heading industry. So all important works, cloud era, et cetera. Um, also partnering with cloud providers like EMR on AWS and uh, Microsoft Azure, heading for here. And also <coughs> partnering with the folks at, at Spring Source, because we do see a lot of enterprise apps, of course, being based in Spring. Um, We've also had a lot of investment in terms of Twitter and Etsy and eBay and other companies building out open source projects, building build out open source projects on top of Cascadia. So in some ways, we're kind of like assembly programming for, or assembly level programming for some of these functional languages like uh, Scala and, and Cascadia that Twitter and others have really invest a lot of money to build on top of. I have a few case studies that I've listed here. I think these were the ones that have blue logos. Um, we have a lot of too. Um, okay, so about system integration, in cascading, there's uh, one of the kind of components we have is called the tap. So we have a notion of a source tap, which is where you get input data. We have the notion of a sync tap, which is where the output goes. We also have the notion of a trap, which is a different type of tap uh, that's used to uh, essentially capture exceptional data, so data exceptions. Um, taps are the very basic way to handle integration with other frameworks. So there's taps with HBase, taps for Memcache, Cassandra, et cetera, et cetera. And, and really writing a new tap for a different API, it's only a few lines of coding job. Um, there's also support for Thrift and Avro, different types of serialization, depending on, on what a, a company standardizes there. But an interesting, interesting thing about taps is that um, they define where the data is coming from, what shape the data is in. So they define flows of data tuples. And by analyzing the graph of all the incoming data, the outcome data as taps, we can essentially deduce what the data schema is and also take a look at the surface information about the data problems. So the taps are a very interesting abstraction. Um, another kind of integration is uh, topologies. So this is to say, nice two-bit word, um, to say that you can run cascading apps on different types of frameworks. Hadoop is one of those, it's the first one we did. We've also done work uh, for what we call local mode, which is where you just bypass Hadoop entirely. Twitter and others, they use local mode when they want to run a whole bunch of unit tests. Like they just want to blast through a bunch of unit tests and not wait for Hadoop to do that. Um, and there's other applications too. Climate has some interesting meteorological uh, use cases based on that. Um, there's also a topology uh, tuple spaces. So uh, we've been doing work on a project where we're building out support to run queries on top of giga spaces and other types of in-memory data grids, um, general category for, for giga spaces. So our idea there is that you build the app at an abstraction layer, but then you have a planner 
which is basically kind of like a compiler for the query. And it plans toward whatever topology you need to use. That could be Hadoop, it could be a memory data grid, it could be a graph database, etc. So as far as topologies, um, there's a lot to pick and choose from. Like I said, we, we focus on Hadoop first, gigaspaces, but certainly you can make the argument for uh, you know, something like uh, React, Definitely what's going on with CUDA, Redis, etc. Jump fire. Another area of integration for cascading is ANSI SQL. So, um, actually, I've, I've never said this before in public, so I get to say it for the first time. My handlers allow me to do it. But we went out and partnered with a team called Optique. And how many people have ever used Mondrian or Pintado? Okay. So, this is the team behind Mondrian. Um, so they've been doing open source, they have a code base that's been doing ANSI SQL parsers, uh, optimizers, um, and it's, it's really uh, industry proven over a long track record. So we partnered with them to take their parser optimizer and then put our flow planners underneath that. So you read SQL, but it plans out cascading maps under the hood, and you get a jar file and you run that in a cluster. And this is a, a very convenient way to take and migrate SQL workloads off of something like Teradata, because we can read that SQL directly and then run it on cheaper clusters. Okay, clusters. Um, now, SQL queries are an interesting thing in, in terms of talking about abstraction layers. Because when you look at a SQL layer, peel back the onion skin, um, at one layer you've got a, a parser, so we're talking about NC SQL. At another layer, you've got a logical planner, um, your options. And then below that, you've got your physical plan. The physical plan is what cascading has been from the start. Um, below that, there's a notion of leveraging machine data. So in a relational database, you take query stats, you take table stats, you feed those into the optimizer. And we have a very similar notion where you take app history and, and tuple stats and feed it into the optimizer. Um, as far as topology, uh, you know, definitely a relational database, you're you're hitting the trees, basically. But here, in, in this notion, uh, we have a lot more flexibility. We can run it on Hadoop, we can run it on memory grids, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of, of engineering visualization, with relational databases, you work with entity relationship diagrams. We have something called a flow diagram that provides a very similar kind of function. Um, and in terms of schema, you know, there's table schema versus tuple schema. Um, in terms of catalog, we are also surfacing uh, essentially a, a, a tap identifier usage database, which ends up looking a lot, effectively, like a relational catalog. And in terms of provenance, what we can do is, is track your app history and produce a graph of who are the producers and who are the consumers of different data sets. And from that surface, some analysis of, of your data provenance. So a lot of enterprise customers are really very concerned about that. Uh, another kind of integration that we address is about machine learning. So, uh, actually, this is, this is an interesting question. Who's ever used PMML before? Okay, got some. Um, one of the things we did was to look and, and see that a lot of people have been asking about how to integrate SAS and Hadoop, how to build apps that cross between that. Um, also, R and Hadoop. Um, my teams have used R a lot in the past, so I was, I was very sensitive about that. So what we did was to extend cascading and build out functions that can read PMML models and then build out the JVM classes underneath um, that will parallelize the algorithms we used, run this on the cluster. Um, the idea there is you could train a, a predictive model in SAS, maybe a random forest or, or logistic regression, something like that, capture the model parameters, they're exported as PMML, it's just XML, and then run that in your cascading flow, and um, cascading will, will take care of parallelizing it. So that's, people are very interested in that because it, you know, it, it implies a lot of cost reduction. The SAS licenses at scale on the cluster uh, can get pretty easy. And as far as PMML support, you know, it, it varies. Um, everybody in the brother, as far as analytics frameworks, seems to support exporting PMML. Um, so we've done a lot of work towards importing PMML. And of course, not all of these have full coverage across all the possible algorithms, but 
which is pretty good curvature rule. Another area of uh, cascading um, is test-driven development. So usually when you talk about big data apps, test-driven development isn't really on the table. Um, one of the things that we've, we've really paid a lot of attention to is how to build out a TDD practice um, by using cascading to build your apps. And in the case of Cascalog, it, it's, it's actually how we build apps is essentially following TDD um, to define the, the predicates, which are effectively tests. So cascading has this notion of exceptional data. And the idea is kind of like a, a, an exception, a try-catch exception that you'd have in Java for control flow exceptions. Um, we've implemented the idea that uh, you can assert patterns on the tuple flows, on the flow of data going through your app, you can assert patterns on it. And effectively, these are regexes on your tuples. And if something fails the assert, then you can, you can specify what business logic you want to have happen. You can shut down the app, you could shunt that data off to another trap, and maybe have customer support take a look at it, or QA, um, or you could just ignore it and go on. There's different levels. It, it's Basically, it's kind of handled like log for change. Um, but it's, it's interesting because now I, I can apply TDD at scale. I can, I can start out from my data input and start building out the graph of my app. And I can assert the patterns that I expect to have in my input data. And if anything fails that, then great, it gets moved to the side. I can review it and do it. And then I can go and build the first stage of my app of whatever transforms I'm going to do in my first chunk of processing. And I can assert the patterns that I want to see after that's finished, so post condition and run it, verify that it fails, and then code to it until that test works. And then go on and build the next step, the next step. So by the time you've got your full graph built out, you've got full test coverage. So this is kind of an interesting thing because TDD at scale is, is still uh, a little odd. There's an interview about this coming up on O'Reilly Radar that we just did last week. Hopefully we'll go into it in more detail. But um, it's, a, it's a cool idea because then you can take and with your production apps, you can take the data exceptions and reroute those. Maybe they go out to customer support for review. Maybe they go to QA. Maybe they go to ops, finance, etc. Somebody has to take care of it. Um, as far as a, a pattern language, there's a few principles that we talk about in, in terms of the design of the API. And so there's, I think there's six of them here. Yeah. Um, First and foremost, there's the idea of uh, what we call separation concern. Specify what's required instead of how to achieve it. So state your requirements and the business logic that you need to have performed by your app, as opposed to getting into the real details. Let the flow planner take care of those details. And you see this in scholarly especially. It's really, really good at that. It has too. Um, another step is we really focus on being sort of the glue for system integration. We don't want it to be just headed. We want it to be headed plus something else. Um, we have a principle of no surprises. Um, it's actually something where we've been criticized a lot because there, there are things that we probably could try to implement, but we, we prefer to extend the API in ways that are very deterministic and very predictable. So if we can't get that in a new operation, we're, we're not going to do it. You know, we'll leave it for a third party app. But the idea there is when you're working at scale, you don't want surprises because those become very expensive to troubleshoot. Um, another principle is what we call same jar, any scale. So something that's a little bit different with cascading is you, you build an app as a jar file, and you can run it locally, uh, do your unit tests, and your development, get test cycle. And the same jar goes out onto your, your staging cluster and runs through all your unit tests, your continuous integration, whatever. And then the same jar goes and gets scheduled in your production cluster. But you don't change the jar at all as you move up through scale. Instead, we, we use uh, mounting arguments usually to put in whatever injection depends on. Another principle that's, that's kind of different about cascading is what we call plan far ahead. And the idea there is that we leverage that flow diagram. We leverage what information we can get about the app before it runs. So if we can see that the app isn't going to complete correctly, kill it before it even gets submitted to the cluster. And if you can, try to throw an exception during compile and just have the API kill it in advance. But, but the point there is that 
with some added abstractions. One of the problems I've seen with my teams before is you don't get to troubleshoot the problem until you're running off the production cluster. And that can be really expensive. So we want to try to catch, be very aggressive about it fast. We catch as many problems as we can before it submits to the cluster. And another thing that's kind of closely related to that is what we call fail the same way twice. Um, in, in some of the abstraction layers on top of Patio, um, they provide very interesting kinds of optimization, trade-off being that they're also um, arguably non-deterministic, especially with joints. So you see that with PIG, where a little bit of a change in the data will cause fairly, uh, fairly large changes in the implementation of the map produce job steps underneath it. So with cascading, you get what you get. And it, it's very deterministic. And you try to behave the same way every time. Um, that way, when you are troubleshooting at scale, trying to handle a lot of edge cases, you don't burn a lot of engineering cost in that troubleshooting process. There's a great paper. Anybody read the paper uh, Out of the Target by Mosley and Marcus? I, I love that paper. Um, and it actually speaks a lot about, um, well, Clojure was very much informed by it. Um, Castellog is very much an implementation of uh, what Mosley and Marcus were talking about. Um, OK, so real quick, um, I, I imagine I imagine you all have seen word count before <laughs> a few times. So word count's great because it shows numeric processing and symbolic processing. And long and short of that is if you can run word count efficiently in parallel at scale, you can do a much, much larger class of problems. So you know the typical pseudocode for MapReduce word count looks like this. And the flow diagram for cascading looks like this. Um, there's some URLs here. There's a, a series of blog posts that we did to help show introduction to cascading, very, very simple apps, but um, explained in a lot of detail. And we, we start out from just a simple file copy, we move up to a word count, and from there we move up to a TI, uh, TFID implementation. So that's the uh, annotation URL. But um, word count for us in cascading turns out to be about 18 lines of Java. Um, so it's definitely a lot less code. It's more concise code than the word count that comes with Apache Caddy. So you get some benefits there. As far as the flow planner, uh, this is literally what comes out of the flow planner. Um, this is what's being executed. Actually, it's a, a dot file <coughs> representation. Now, I'm gonna, not going to go into scalding too much, but when you look at the scalding equivalent of this, um, it's, it's much, much more concise. And the, the thing that I find very interesting about scalding is there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between what's in the diagram and the function's being called in scalding. I mean, there's no fluff there. It's just very pure, very functional, very easy to follow. Of course, it has all kinds of upsides in terms of software engineering. So I really love scalding. I'm not going to go into much detail, but um, analyzing use cases that we see in production deployments, I see that a lot of scalding work is very much pointed at large-scale data services, um, Twitter and Etsy and eBay. Some very, very interesting work there. I'll talk about that. In contrast, Cascalog is a, a really different language. It's basically Lisp in Java. Um, and I, I did Lisp programming. I had a Lisp machine you know, 25 years ago. So I, I love this. Depending on your, your taste for Lisp, um, it may be a different thing. But it's interesting because in looking at use cases, Cascalog is arguably the most advanced uses of cascading. Um, there was a, a programming language called Datalog sort of variant of Prologue from way, way back. And it, it really sought to implement some of the original intentions of the relational model. And it does it in a very declarative way. And that's what Cascalog implemented in Clojure. And then they back it by cascading. So a, a key difference there is in Scalding, they took the collections API and they, they take the, the distributed lists and treat them as pipes. And use cascading to back it. In Cascalog, it's different because they implemented data log and the, the different functions in data log are backed by cascading, especially aggregation. Um, Cascalog is really interesting because you can go the full gamut. You can run ad hoc queries in it. It's, it's got a command prompt and it's very interactive. And you can do ad hoc work um, much like you would with Hive um, once you learn the cast closure syntax. 
but it's also it's really compact. I mean, when we look side by side, Haskell log is the SQL. We see much, much less code blocking on the Haskell side. What's interesting though is that if you take those queries, those ad hoc queries in Haskell log, those are essentially the logical predicates, and you can do a composable. So you blend them together, you end up with your app. And it ends up being, uh, like I say, a, a statement of, of test driven development uh, very truly. Also, um, the build system is called Lanigan, and it is a joy to work with. Okay, so um, I'll step back a little bit and delve into some theory. Um, so I, I, I like to look and see how do we get here in terms of big data apps? How do we get here in terms of using Hadoop? What have been the drivers historically? And where are we right now? Where are we headed? So from that perspective, I like to start out looking at about 1996. So 1996 was interesting because not a lot of people were using Java yet. There was no servlets. We were doing Perl and CGI, frankly, that's what I was doing. C++ and Perl and CGI. Um, and I've shown in the diagrams here, I'm going to show in red where the data feed, feedback loops are. So back in the, the good old days of Perl CGI, um, you know, we'd do some SQL queries, and the analyst would take it and do some pivot tables in, in a spreadsheet, maybe a PowerPoint slide deck, um, and that would go to some VP who you know, put down goals for product and they'd make a PRD. It's a very manual process. The data feedback was very, very manual, led to a lot of silos. Um, so there was, a, there was a kind of a sea change in the industry that I like to point to, and that was immediately after this, Q3 of 1997. And Q3 of 1997 was interesting because uh, Greg Linden was leading a team at Amazon. Uh, Randy Shoup had a team at eBay. Um, Eric Brewer had Inktomi, which later became Yahoo Search. And uh, of course, Larry and Sergey had Google that was still at Stanford that was going to be rolled out pretty soon. So there were four teams that were sort of grappling with the same problem, and that was really big data, really big scale. And they came up to essentially the same conclusion. If you take commodity servers, Intel, Linux, and you take and parallelize your workloads, you could scale up horizontally, and you could knock down orders of magnitude more data in a much, much more cost-effective way. And so in Q3 of 1997, like I say, uh, Greg Linden and, and Randy Shoup, independently, their teams put that into place and did all the retooling at Amazon and eBay, respectively. <clears throat> so that when Q4 of 1997 rolled around, that was the big tsunami of e-commerce. Uh, Q4 of 97 is when e-commerce really hit. Those companies were in position to literally you know, earned billions of years based on that. They did very well. And, and so from that kind of sea change, you see uh, a rise of what I would call big data, what I would call data science. Um, the thing that really characterizes it, I've shown in red here, the idea is that you know, at, at this point in time now, we're looking at more kind of middleware models, um, and we're collecting a lot more log data, a lot more machine data about um, social interactions customers. So what those teams did was to take and aggregate, and again, talking about macroduce, reduces, they aggregated the log data and they applied algorithmic modeling, which was different because before people had mostly focused on data modeling. So a big change there was algorithmic modeling. And from that, they created data products, uh, predictive models, classifiers, etc. And so you get this sort of automated feedback loop um, coming into play there. And, and a lot of big successes downstream using that, like LinkedIn, um, Jonathan Goldman did, you know, people you may know. Um, you know, a lot of companies, Facebook, et cetera, have, have followed this. What's interesting is that MapReduce came out of this period, um, 2002, at Google. And then subsequently, a few years later, Doug Cutting picked it up and did the project <clears throat> that, that became Hattie. Um, now, I, I, I don't want to speak too much on behalf of Google, partly because I'm under NDA, um, but uh, maybe some of you who work there or have worked there, you could, you could nod your heads. Um, basically, Google is three generations beyond this. If you talk to Googlers, they have infrastructure that's way, way beyond where Hattie is at. And I find that kind of ironic because now we're rolling out Hattie en masse to corporate America, and you've got this great shiny new toy. Google is generations beyond that. Um, but, but it's interesting to see this change from data modeling to algorithmic modeling, and how that really led to big data. Um, now, another problem, though, is that companies like Google are 
they generally don't pull in the kimono very much. They, they don't like you to see exactly what they're doing. It's proprietary. But if you wanted to see a flavor of how Google scale, how they handle data services, um, I would highly recommend what's going on now with Twitter and Etsy and eBay and others, particularly with respect to Scaldi um, and related projects, because they are doing exactly that kind of approach, very much that kind of approach. But they're doing it in the open. They're doing it in the source. Um, so that's one of the other reasons why I think Scaldi is, is incredibly interesting. Um, and so I've, I've drawn here a diagram of you know, rolling the clock up now, what do we see amongst our, our customers? Um, we see a very different kind of feedback loop. There's a lot more machine data. It's not just about the customers. But now there's more and more machine data about the apps themselves. So um, probably an analogy, I, I have friends at Lawrence Livermore, um, some who work on the, uh, the fusion experiments there, IF. And you know, it's interesting to hear them talk and, and, and give the conference talks and whatnot, because they collect more data about their machine than they do about the physics experiment. And I've, I've heard numbers of like 4x more, more data on the IF project um, about the machine itself. And really that makes sense because you want to make sure the machine is working correctly. You want to verify it before you go off and make some claims about physics that are going to get shot down. Um, but we're seeing a very similar thing with respect to clusters. You know, uh, the Twitter, uh, a friend of mine uh, wrote a project called Mesos, um, which is related, I should say, to another project called Yarn, you may have heard about. But the idea is cluster management. And uh, so anyway, the, the, the people working on Mesos, the, the Twitter operations team, they go out to meetups and they, they pull up, um, they've got a 40,000 or 40,000 core cluster that runs all of their revenue models. So this is all the real time revenue coming into Twitter. And they pull up the root for that and kill it right in front of everybody with their ops people in the front row. And, um, and then they just count the seconds until it pops back up. So they've been using Mesos to, uh, to do very intelligent cluster scheduling and make their clusters much smarter, much more robust. And the idea there is that we can take machine data about our apps, feed it down into the cluster, and do some really interesting things for, for fault tolerant workflows. That's what we see now. Um, so, you know, I just looking ahead, more smarter clusters, a lot more machine data, and the sort of feedback loop of optimizing at the planner level. Um, Leo Bremen, he wrote a paper in 2001 which really documented uh, the change that was going on from data modeling to algorithmic modeling. Sort of that early success period of Amazon, and Google, and eBay, etc. Um, it's really, it's a hilarious paper because he, he stepped on a lot of toes, some of my former professors included. Um, and, and so he published you know, the, the criticism as well as the rebuttals. So it's, it's a great paper, it's called Two Cultures, and it really documents what happened in the origins of big data, in my opinion. Um, also, DJ Patil, uh, used to be chief scientist at LinkedIn, he's got a couple of free mini books on O'Reilly, and one of them is about building data science teams, the other is about building data products, I, I highly recommend this. Um, Okay, so in interest of time, I'm gonna scoot through this part. It's a little bit more theoretical, but we build workflows at Cascading, and so we have reasons why. Um, to us, a workflow is about plumbing. It's about connecting the taps and the flows and the filters and the traps, all these plumbing metaphors, to create enterprise apps. Um, and from our perspective, you know, I hear a lot of arguments about why SQL is better and why NoSQL is better and compare and contrast it's structured data and unstructured data. But from our perspective, we're interested in the process of structuring data. And, it, and if you go back to the, the, where the relational model came from, like Kirkot, um, he was really talking about that. He also, he didn't really like SQL that much. <laughs> I, I find SQL pretty interesting, but he, he had other plans for a relational model. So I, I definitely recommend his paper. It's very informative. Cascalog is very close to it. Um, so for us, um, for us, a workflow as an abstraction layer, um, it really grew out of the fact that uh, the API author was hanging around Nudge before Hadoop even had a name, and just realized that this Hadoop stuff, writing to Hadoop API directly for enterprise Java developers, which he was managing, that wasn't going to fly. So he wanted to come up with an abstraction layer to try to help resolve that, and try to really enforce best practices. Um, and, and one of the things that really struck me when I first started working at Cascadings, um, how, how many of y'all have ever run across uh, Don Knuth, 
delivered programming. Okay, so one of the things that struck me is looking at the email forums for cascading, the developers uh, who were working on different sides of the world, when they ran into a bug, the first thing they would do is say, show me your flow diagram. So they were really using this literal program, flow diagrams, as a visual metaphor um, to have to troubleshoot problems remotely. So you know, it's got some great aspects there, collaboration. Um, we look at workflows also as capturing the business process. So talking about trade-offs, talking about what does the stakeholder want to see in this app, and really capturing that almost at the level of what you would say from like big or people. I don't know if I should mention this. I'm not sure if those are dirty words or not. It's like people. Um, from a data architect's perspective, uh, a workflow is interesting because it, it talks about schema, it talks about provenance, uh, it, it captures a, a lot of the essential matters of these apps interacting with each other. And in terms of system integration, of course, we mentioned that already with the tabs and topologies. It's not just headed in isolation, it's about headed working with other components. Um, from my perspective as a data scientist, a workflow is interesting because it's a DAG, it's a directed acyclic graph. I can use a lot of math to try to optimize really large scale enterprise apps if I've got them represented functional language as a DAG. Um, and I'll scoot through these uh, But for the operations people, um, this is an interesting approach because all of this business process and all, all, of, all of this specification gets boiled down to a jar file, a single jar file. And so that means you have one jar file, one connected space to instrument for exception handling, for notifications, uh, for tracking your utilization, for buildback, etc. Try to collect it all in the context of a jar file. And the reason for that is working, building these kind of apps, it's not so much about the bigness of data, it's about the complexity of the process. And so we try to make things as transparent as possible to knock down that complexity. Okay, so um, let's go through this real quick. For the analysts, we've been working on SQL. So I haven't, this is only, I, I haven't gotten to speak a whole lot about SQL before, but um, for instance here, I took the, the test suite for MySQL, the test database, and it's, it's a collection of CSV flat files, and just did a real simple DDL overlay on it to tell it what schema was expected, and then blam, bring up the shell prompt, and without any configuration, um, I can go in and I can look at the table schema, I can run queries, etc just by pointing at, at flat files. Um, if I want to do a JDBC driver, again, Optique makes this pretty simple. It's very standard JDBC, and you know, run it, build it, run on Hadoop, and plan you got your results. It's, it's definitely not about um, low latency kind of queries, so I wouldn't see this as a replacement for tools like Hive or, or Teradata, et cetera, if that's what you really need. But if you want to move some workloads off of Teradata onto your Hadoop cluster, this is a, a pretty quick way. For the scientists, like I said, we've got PML. Um, I'll, I'll have these slides posted tonight on SlideShare, but um, we did a little case study here. Of, I, I built a lot of anti-fraud classifiers in the past. So I did one where I took a bunch of customer word history and uh, did some modeling in R and built a random forest classifier, exported as PML, run it at scale on Hadoop. So we're talking about the use case of where the PML fits in. Um, here's some R code to train a model. And it exports PML that hopefully no humans should ever have to um, But then to bring it into a cascading app is pretty simple. We've actually got a, a command line tool if you want to run a PML model on Hadoop at scale. We've got a tool that's pre-built. It's open source. You can just add the PML model as a command line option. And you can also set command line options to do regression test sign. Um, to integrate um, PMML, it's really just two lines of code. Um, so here's a, a sample app. And if you want to run it on the cloud, um, just as part of this case study, we showed how to send it off to EMR. And then with the results, the cloud coming back. So that, that's a cascading.org slash pattern. Um, and like I said, we've got random forest, different clustering models, linear regression, just regression, etc. Um, 
one, one other thing that I included here, I'll, I'll scoot through it pretty quick, but we did a project with CMU, Carnegie Mellon, um, for a machine learning graduate workshop. And we took open data from the city of Palo Alto and worked with the students to build out a recommender system and then discuss how to extend it. So if you want to go and grab that code, it's on GitHub. Um, but it's a, a fairly beefy app in Castellon. And it also has pretty much the same thing in Java. So if you ever want to see them side by side, there's a good comparison. Um, Palo Alto exports all their municipal C, uh, GIS data. So we've got data about roads and parks and bike paths and trees and whatnot. And we built a mobile app um, using uh, GPS logs on the smartphones and a, and a recommender so you can find a nice shady spot to walk. Um, the raw data is definitely unstructured data, looks like that. But to take and go through the process of structuring <coughs> that data from the raw export into something you can run in an app, um, we show how to use Castlelog. Um, basically, you go from ad hoc queries into building flows. Um, we added a little bit of metadata, not cheating, just juicing up the data. And you end up, here's an example of Castlelog program um, for building up a data product out of the Palo Alto data. This is about all the trees in Palo Alto. Um, and what the results look like. There's also some road data in there. Um, there's some R scripts to do some analysis and visualization. Um, and just, we do a lot of modeling of the different roads and where the trees are near them, what the traffic rates look like. Um, blend that all together into a recommender with some GPS tracks from smartphones and plan. So these are, um, there's actually results for me, my top results ended up, there's a, a block with a couple of really big American sweet gums. It's about two blocks away from my train stop. So it is actually a place I like to go walking, so I, I guess the recommended work. But if you want some good sample code there in Castellog, I definitely recommend this. I, I, I went down this track because most of the Castellog examples that I could find were like three or four lines long. You couldn't really dive in and see what's going on. So we came up with something about 400 lines long. Um, all right, so cascading is about workflows. It's about a pattern language. It's about using your JVM-based cluster resources. Uh, definitely, we, we appeal more towards the verticals, like finance and transportation, et cetera, that are more risk averse. Um, but what we're trying to do is make it simpler to write apps and address complexity. Got a book coming out about this. It's uh, it's called Enterprise Data Workflows with Cascading uh, O'Reilly, and uh, we're, we should have some Gallic copies coming up at, at uh, Strata. It's going to be a rough cut. It's pretty soon too, so if you want to check it out online. Um, it, anybody going to Strata? Have them send a clip. Okay. Well, if, if you want a discount coupon, um, I've, I've got probably Dean and I both have a lot of this coupons, so. If you want to get a discount, um, I definitely recommend Strata Conference. And uh, a bunch of, uh, of links here about the cascading project, um, the events that we have, some of the third party contributions, and so Thank you very much.